praying for you. How many are ready for a message? Amen. Uh, praise the Lord. I would just listen to that song, Hallelujah. How many know the word Hallelujah is said the same in every language? Amen. Uh, I, I went to Guatemala, they say Hallelujah, the same way we say Hallelujah here. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, you speak Spanish. But I mean, uh, Hallelujah is actually comes from Hebrew. Uh, uh, and basically, Hallelujah, you've heard me say this before, Hallelujah uh, means praise be. Yah is short for Yahweh, so Hallelujah means praise be to Yah. I think if we say the whole thing, though, it should be Hallelujah Yahweh. Amen. No? You're not buying? Okay, we'll go back to Hallelujah then. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, uh, but <clears throat> Amen. Glory. I was in prayer this week, and and and. and God has been giving me a message. I've been going over some things. Did you ever get to a familiar scripture and think you know it, and then God shows you something else that you didn't see? I had one of those weeks. <laughs> and uh, so, praise the Lord, I was drawn off my 30-odd uh, years, 36-odd years or whatever of, of, of ministering and preaching, but God came up with something I hadn't seen before. Isn't that a it's, it's possible. Praise the Lord. <laughs> anyway, the title of my message this morning is A Lifestyle of Breakthrough. And, and I, I picked that particular title for this reason is basically everything that affects our life, uh, everything that's valuable to us is done in a lifestyle. Amen? How many, how many have, a, have, a, have a lifestyle a certain way? Maybe you have a lifestyle of certain eating habits. Anybody do that? The uh, seafood. I see food, I eat it. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but when you change life, I mean, back in the day when I was about 50 pounds heavier than I was now, and I was trying to, trying to lose weight, I, um, I tried different diets. How many's ever tried diets? Amen. And uh, how many's ever had a diet and they lose the weight and then they get off the diet and the weight comes back? I the only one or something, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And I realize I, need, I don't need a diet. I need something that's a lifestyle. I need to change my eating habits, and then basically I can keep the weight off the head. So I, I begin to research out things I could do to change my lifestyle. Uh, and it worked, praise the Lord, uh, since 2009. And I've kept 50 pounds. Uh, I used to be 50 pounds heavier than I am right now. So... Um, uh, what, how, I, how I did that is I got a, I just stretched myself and became taller. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> uh, but I worked at it, and, and it was a slow process at first, but the more I made it a lifestyle change, it was no debating, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I stuck to, and lo and behold, this is what it became. And after a while, you, when it becomes a lifestyle, the other stuff, you don't really miss it. I want to, now I'm not talking about food this morning. I know I just did, but what I want to be in a lifestyle of breakthrough, as Christians, we ought to live a lifestyle that we don't shy away from a problem because a problem comes up, but we do know that God's going to break through for us. And so that's why I come up with the lifestyle of breakthrough. In other words, what happens is we will take, we are like electricity, we will take the path of least resistance. <laughs> a lot of times, right? Uh, I mean, don't mess with our comforts. We like to be comfortable. As Americans, we like, we like comforts. We like recreation, but we like our comforts. We like our food. We like all this other stuff. And what happens is the very, if, if we take those things that are harmful us and make them a lifestyle, then we become, uh, uh, it, it becomes a detriment to our health. Can I suggest this morning that the same thing happens in our spiritual life? We have those certain scriptures we like. We have those certain things and certain, certain way of thinking. And if somebody comes up with something different, and before we go research it, we just kind of kick it out of our brain. Like, ah, it's not talking. You're not talking to me. Ah, we don't need that. And we begin to dismiss things that should be incorporated in our lifestyle. For instance, if I stood up here this morning and I talked about prayer, how many in this church right here or view of my live stream, how many would say, I need to pray more? Raise your hand if you think you need to pray more. So I could look at you and say, you've got a prayer deficit. Now, I could go back next Sunday and, say, you, you, uh, and ask you the same question. How many will still raise their hand that they have a prayer deficit? <laughs> Why? Because until it becomes a lifestyle change, it's still the same old problem. We can acknowledge we have it, but it doesn't make it go away until we do something to actually change it. I said this, I said this a long time ago, and I still stand by it today. If you don't like change, 
in your life, then Christianity has very little to say to you. If you oppose change in any way, shape, or form, Christianity, again, has very little to say to you because basically the basics of basics in Christianity is that we become a new creation that never before existed. Our spirits become brand new. I don't know how much of a change you need, but that's about the biggest change as you're ever going to see. The problem comes in is when we try to get the outside, uh, try to change the inside from the outside, but we're not changed from the outside in, we're changed from the inside out. Oh, praise the Lord. That's another yeah. message for another day. But I'm going to, so I, I, I wrote, so the sustaining of a lifestyle, uh, to su the sustained lifestyle of breakthrough instead of problem management. How many are finding themselves are just managing problems? Oh, no, not this again. Oh, here we go again. Just, I mean, we just get money in the bank and the car breaks down. Uh, we just get this much ahead and this happens. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And, we, we, and we go from problem to problem rather than from breakthrough to breakthrough. We focus on the problem, even if we know, and if we've seen it in the past, that God could do something again. We still go, oh no, not that again. Oh no, here comes a problem. Do I have anybody's interest so far? Yes, amen. Uh, praise the Lord. I want to show you how to, how to transform some of that stuff. We're going to give you some how-tos. I think a good, uh, solid message should give you some how-tos. If we're going to talk about change, then we need to know some, you need a strategy on changing. How many know that when we read the Bible, we come to God in prayer, whatever it is, every revelation of God's nature is an invitation to divine encounter. Every revelation that God gives us, how many know what a revelation is? A revealing of something. So if we read something in the Scripture, oh, I didn't say it before. Well, every revelation of God's nature to tell us who the Father is. If you look at the life of Jesus, when Jesus walked the earth, he demonstrated the heart of the Father. So you can look at Jesus. Matter of fact, he said this. He said, the only things I do is what my Father tells me. Amen. So basically, whatever you saw Jesus do was the heart of the Father being expressed through him. Now, some people have a problem with this. I don't. I think it's perfectly fine that Jesus said this. He said, without the Father, I can do nothing. Now, wait a minute. He's God. He can do anything he wants to do. But he said, no, without the Father instructing me, I can do nothing. Why? Because when Jesus was born to, uh, and became man like we are, he lay, laid aside his deity and he walked with the relationship of the Father just as we're supposed to walk. See, if Jesus came down and he did all the miracles and we say, okay, and he did it as God, we'd be spectators, we could see that. That was great, that's God, but that's God. I mean, God could do anything, sure. But it wouldn't say anything about us. But instead, if Jesus comes down and he does miracles as a man, okay, and did those things with connection to the Father, and he says, you go and do likewise. How many has ever seen where Jesus commands his people to do something that's impossible for us to do? For instance, healing. It is impossible for anybody in this sanctuary, I don't care if you've got a medical degree, it's impossible to miraculously heal anybody. But Jesus says, go out and lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Hmm, why? Because he, he showed us how it's done, but we have to have that connection to the Father and connection to God to transfer that power because we're transferring from a realm that has no sickness and disease into a realm that has sickness and disease. And that realm has to overrule the realm that we stand in now for miracles to happen. And that takes the faith. Well, how did Jesus do? Well, he listened to the Father. What do we do? Well, we listen to the Word the same way. And then the two realms connect, the physical realm that we live in here and the heavenly. Let me get into my message. Uh, breakthrough is an interesting, is interesting uh, subject, interesting uh, term. How many know that today, how many uh, have heard preachers say this, even me, I've said it, uh, that this is an unusual time we live in because of the pandemic? How many have ever said that? I got something from the Lord. Can I share it with you about the pandemic? that the church has been given a unique opportunity to demonstrate the hope of the Savior Praise God. Amen. through the pandemic. Amen. I can get up here and say, I get all kinds of messages. Man, it, this has totally transformed and changed our ministry. How we have churches is, is totally different. We still have people that are afraid to come into a sanctuary like this, even though we've had no cases here. So there's a, f a fear over this, and then there's a fear of the science and the government, and the science is, <laughs> yeah, science, they can't even get it together. 
And one says one thing, and I, I, I need to wear a mask, I need to be vaccinated, I need this, now I need to wear two masks. I need, and all this stuff goes on, and this is what we focus on, trying to sort out how I can live my life as normally as I can under the circumstances when God never intended us to be under the circumstances. Amen? Amen? So what happens is the church right now, this is what I see the church as. The church has a fantastic opportunity to demonstrate what the hope of Christ looks like. Praise God. Amen. Yes, sir. You see a pandemic, I see another breakthrough. Yes. No, I didn't. I see the pandemic the same as you. Not that I'm, I'm, I'm not putting myself above anybody. We all wrestle with the same mind and the same mindset. Yes. But guess what? I also see a breakthrough. I can see light at the end of the tunnel. I can see it, and I can walk in it, and we can walk totally free from this. I mean, we've been, we've been claiming Psalms 91 since last March. We're coming almost a year into this, into this pandemic, and we've been claiming Psalms 91. Well, Psalms 91 has been working for us, hasn't it? It's standing on the scripture. Amen. And we've been praying for people and God's still doing miracles. It seems like his. So, so it is. And, and our church is coming back slowly but surely coming back as far as in church attendance. However, our online presence is growing and growing and growing exponentially from all over. I mean, we got people all over the different states and even in foreign countries. I think the furthest uh, comment we had a while ago was Singapore, China. <laughs> and I haven't left Key West. <laughs> I'm still here. And we're speaking to Singapore, China. Uh, I mean, this is, it, it, what an opportunity. What a magnificent thing God has placed in the lap of the church. But if we don't embrace it as a breakthrough, then we'll embrace it as a problem. If, if you embrace your problems, you're going to have problems next week and the week after, you're going to have the same problems. How many's ever had a car breakdown as a problem? How many's had it again? And, and again. Even when you get a new car, it happens again and things break down, right? Machinery and so on and so forth. So, so why, instead of looking for the next breakdown, because that causes us to buy insurances, buy, oh, I'm going to get the warranty coverage here, warranty coverage. Sure, then find somebody to fix it even with the warranty covered and all this other stuff. So I'm going to t take all these precautions, bleeding my other resources that God has given me because I'm afraid something might happen. Hmm. Do you know insurance companies are betting with you? How many here have insurance? Buying car insurance, whatever kind of insurance. insurance. Do you know what the insurance company is betting on? It's, it's a gamble. They're betting. They're betting that nothing ever happens to you. That you walk a complete problem free, you never get sick, your stuff never breaks. That's what they're betting on. What you're betting on is that everything's going to break. This could happen, that could happen, that could happen, that could happen. Hmm, I'm going to leave it go at that. I'm not going to, in, I'm not going to indulge that anymore. I'll just leave it, meditate on that. Praise the Lord. Amen. I was looking in the, in the scripture. I, I focused on the word breakthrough. This is what I heard the Lord say. He says, prepare for your next breakthrough. There's another breakthrough coming, another breakthrough coming. And it was over the months that I've listened to this, and it, and it finally dawned on me this week uh, that God wants us to live from breakthrough to breakthrough. So I went back and I, I went to, did, a, did a study, and I found out in 2 Samuel chapter 5, you can turn if you want to. I'm going to go to a bunch of scriptures so you can just write them down or you can, you can turn whatever you want to do. But in 2 Samuel chapter 5, in verse 20, it says, David is praying. First of all, he's praying. He's on the battlefield. He sees the Philistines, Philistines in a stronghold, and he goes to the Lord. He says, Lord, shall I overtake them? Shall I, shall I conquer them? Will you, and this is the question he had, will you deliver them into my hands as an enemy of Israel? And the Lord says, yes, I surely will. He says, you go ahead and confront them. He said, and, you, and I will deliver them into your hands. So David goes forth. And sure enough, God caused a breakthrough. He uses the word. I'll give it to you in Hebrew in a minute. He goes, well, a breakthrough to where it's so magnificent, so supernatural, that David called the place Baal Perezim. Perezim, Perezim. How do you say it, Jason? Perezim. And Jason looked up last night. Baal Perezim. Baal Perezim means Lord of the Breakthroughs. What happened was they had a breakthrough, and don't you know, just like your car breaking down, it happened again. The Philistines got back together, they reorganized after David had conquered them, okay, uh, you know, at, at Baal, uh, praise him, 
Okay, when he conquered them at Belparaiso, it, it was a mount there, and he conquered them. They moved on, but then they reorganized. Now, here's what David did that we wouldn't do. He said, well, God did it once, he do it again. Did it for Elder Skip, he'll do it for me. Without even consulting the word or the prayer, we'll go and we'll do, I'll do the same thing. But David didn't do it. He goes back to the Lord. He said, Lord, shall I confront them as before? Shall I make a, a, a frontal attack on this enemy? And God says, no, do not. He says, instead, he says, encompass around about them. He says, when you hear the noise of marching in the treetops, attack. What had happened? We had a completely different approach to the same problem, same enemy. But how many will go back and do the same thing over and over and over again because it worked for the service? Well, it worked for, it worked for Brother Jason. It's got to work for me. God's no respecter of persons. We start quoting that way. But did we ever sit down and ask the Father, what kind of breakthrough are you going to deliver? And how shall I approach? When Jesus asks us to do the impossible, like I've shared with healing, he also wants us to confer him for the plan. In other words, we have to rely upon him. Let's face it, I can lay hands on all day and a person can get miraculous healed, or these hands don't do anything. I mean, this is just in my hands. But it's when we connect to the Holy Spirit with faith that now my hands become something else when he uses them the way he says to use them, when he says to use them, how he says to use them. Are you here? Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. So okay so far? Yes. I haven't gotten to the tough stuff yet. Are you all right? Yes. Praise the Lord. I saw that, and I just liked that. Baal praise him, Baal praise him, Baal praise him. I said, this is pretty good, Baal praise him. God of breakthrough, Lord of the breakthrough. And what the word breakthrough really means in the Hebrew, in this scripture, it means a ripping apart. How many remember that when Jesus was in the River Jordan being baptized by John the Baptist, that the heavens opened, and a voice came from heaven saying from the Father, this is my beloved Son whom well pleased? If you look at that context, it isn't just with a puffy little cloud just separated. And this little dove came down and just, and just, that isn't how it happened at all. What it says in the Greek, it actually refers to that God ripped open the heavens and shot it through. That's a little bit different than how we manage it or how we picture it on a Sunday morning, Sunday school quarterly. God ripped it apart. He pierced the heavens. And he said, this is my beloved son who am well pleased. And at that time, Satan also heard that because we have an enemy, don't we? Yes. Not an enemy with each other. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against pressure, powers, powers, through the darkness. Paul said, gives the whole thing. Talked about spiritual warfare and other, other occasions. Amen? But the fact is, God is setting us up right now, right today, in this church, Key West, Florida, He's setting us up for the next breakthrough. Amen. Thank you. But we're going to have to get the strategy from him. Amen. The strategizing, the setting of the platform is up to us to do. How does this work? Why is it? I mean, God is sovereign. He can come down here anytime he wants to and do whatever he wants to do. Why do we have to pray? Why don't we just sit back and let God do all this stuff? I mean, he owns the planet. He owns the earth. He owns the universe. Why not just sit back and let it happen? Right? How many's ever had that question? Yes, yes sir. Hmm. Amen. Now you want the answer? Yes, sir. Come back next week and I'll give you the answer. That's not kidding. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How many here rent 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 a home? Raise your hand if you rent. Okay, I got a few people who are renters. The rest of your homeowners. The rest of your, your arm are broke. Okay, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> in the name of Jesus, fix all the arms in here. Praise the Lord. But, uh, so if you rent, let me ask you something. If you rent a home, do you own the home? No. You don't own a home because you rent. You wouldn't pay rent to somebody else if you owned it. I own my home, so I'm not going to pay rent to anybody. If somebody comes up and says, I own this home, pay me rent. I say, get lost. Here's the deed. I own it. Beat it, buster. When Adam sinned, how many let me take you back to Genesis. When Adam sinned, God had given him, in the garden, he had given him deed title to the entire earth. God still owns it, but Adam had deed title to it. Now, if I own a home that you're in, I use Joy and Dalton for, for an example. If I, if I own Joy and Dalton's home, because you guys rent, 
Okay, uh, if I own your home, how many know, according to Florida state law and a lot of other states too, I cannot enter that home without permission? I can enter that home if I'm invited. I can legally enter home. Joy will invite me in. You know, tea and crumpets or whatever I want. You know, she'll invite me in. She'll probably feed me. Would you, would you feed me? I got, okay, if, right there's service. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, now, I, if I own the home, I can't intervene on anything inside that home because they pay rent and they're renters. Unless they do something like set the place on fire, then I can step in. Now I'm responsible for the home as far as keep it insured, keep a roof that doesn't leak and so on and so forth. As a landlord, you can tell I used to do this. But, but the fact is, so, but I can't just enter in. Now you got the idea, this is how we are with God. You want God involved in your life, you have to invite him in because we live in a fallen state any way you look at it. And the only hope we have in a fallen state is through Christ Jesus, who has given us the power. And we have to invite him in. You can say, Jesus, 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 all you want. You walk down the street and say, Jesus, 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 doesn't mean he's your Lord. Until what? Until you invite him in. Because when Adam sinned, the deed title of this planet went to, went to uh, Satan. And through Christ Jesus bought the rights back, deed back, as an invitation. Not as a forced issue. Now you got it. So what happens, what moves God through power is knowing that our faith as he looks at, now we open up the door of the house that we rent from God, so to speak, if I could use that analogy again, then we invite him in. Lord, we need your help. Lord, you just come on in. Now let me go back to the same house, Joy and Dalton are on it, and all of a sudden uh, uh, the pipe breaks. Well, I can't just go in there and fix it because I see you know, water's running out the bottom of the house. I just can't go in there and fix it unless they invite me in. They'll probably say, please, please, fix my pipes, fix my pipes. <laughs> now, I'm, I, with that invitation, I can go in there, and we'll make it all better. Amen, Pastor. Now you got the concept down. Yes, but this is what we, this is what we, we serve today. So we're, I'm inviting God into our church ministry. I'm inviting God into my household. I'm inviting him in my life. Amen. Now what happens is the things that he dictates and tells me to do through his word, I carry out by a perpetual decree that he has spoken over me. Hmm, perpetual decree, that's, that's written someplace else, perpetual decree. Oh yeah, the oceans are held back from consuming the land by perpetual decree from the Lord. Did you know that? Yeah. Now I've been here through several hurricanes on this island that's almost sea level. <laughs> and I can tell you that I thank the Lord all day for his perpetual decree. So the island of Key West is not swallowed up in the ocean that surrounds us on his little two by four uh, spit of land. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. All right. Are we ready for something else that God showed me? Yes. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. I'm going to read from 12 through 14. Are you ready for this? Now, before you draw conclusions, you've heard the scripture before, draw conclusions, listen to what I have to say to the end. Okay? This is not a condemnation scripture, but it's going to sound like that when I first read it. But listen to listen, hear me out. I'm going to share to you what, what the meaning of this is, what the Lord showed me this, this was weak. <clears throat> verse, verse 12, Hebrews chapter 5, it says, For one uh, a time you ought to be teachers, you have need of one teach you again from the first principles, the oracles of God, and are become such as having a need of milk and not strong meat. I like how the, this, I'm reading out of King James Version, the string, King James Version uses the word strong meat. I, I shared my, it was my leadership. I said, what do you think that means, strong meat? If I had a steak right here, a porterhouse steak, say, and I, I put this in front of you for supper, and I say this porterhouse steak, I said, this is strong porterhouse steak. What would that mean to you? That is one tough piece of meat. Well, how come you're giving us a strong steak? Why don't you give us a tender steak? I would enjoy a tender steak a whole lot more than I enjoy a, a strong, strong piece of meat. Well, this is what he's saying. This is a strong piece of meat. This is a tough, tough nut. This is, this is a, you're going to have to chew on this for a while. <laughs> I mean, steak, steak, that's not fun. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Verse 13, for everyone that seeth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. 
Verse 14 says, but for strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those that have, listen to this phrase right here, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Discernment comes from digesting strong meat. Now, I'm not talking about the meat on your plate or, the, or, or what you buy in a grocery store. I'm talking about now the meat referring to the word. There's two other scriptures that refer to milk and meat in the word. One is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and 1 Peter 2. 2. Also uses, Peter says that you can grow from sincere milk of the word. So you can grow from, or, so what is the difference? Here in Hebrews, we're seeing the wor word is being broken down into two categories. See this first before I show you the other thing. But it's broken down in two categories. The milk which comforts and soothes, and meat, which provokes change. I'm going to say that again. Milk, which comforts and soothes, and then there's meat, which provokes change. Now, can I give you the revelation that God showed me here? I'm reading this thing. I said, okay, I got this. This is good. He said, no. He said, you're missing it. He said, go back again. He said, you see the word time. I'll read it again. For when the time... You ought to be teachers. You're having the need of one teach you the first principles of oracles of God. Time. In other words, we think, we think, man, you should be better than this by now. How many think that? You should, you should, come on, it's been how many years? Grow up, little Christian. You know who we say it? That's not what it's saying. That's not what it's implying. Because when I looked up the word time, it's, it, it, it is, there's two words in the Greek for time. The one that this is referring to talks about opportunity and season. The other one talks about a space of a time like an event. Well, by, by now, I mean, this, a, time, a space of time went by. That's the other Greek word. But this Greek word, I'm not going to give you a Greek word because I, I don't speak Greek and I'm going to slaughter it if I try it. But anyway, so I just, this is a time. But this Greek word means opportunity and season. So for such a time where you ought to be teachers in this opportunity and season. You should be teachers in this opportunity and season. He didn't say you waited too long, you messed around with the milk too much. He said, no, no, no. He said, we're coming into a new season, a new time. And with this time element, we have to now shift gears from the milk that we used to love and the soothing effort of the word now to those strong meat where we're gonna, it's going to promote change. Now comes the season. God just flipped a switch. He's changing our lifestyle of breakthrough. He's changing our method of breakthrough the way he changed it for David. Amen, and he's changing it this way. How? Well, before you did a frontal attack. Yep. Whatsoever bind on earth is bound in heaven. And that's still, that's still available. That's still that's still. But, but the strategy, when we get into certain circumstances and positions in our life, that strategy must change what the Lord is saying for today. He's saying, no, we got some strong meat. I don't know which, much, if you look at the world, I don't know how much stronger meat you need. Amen. But that is one tough piece of meat. And what do we do in that? Now we become teachers, teachers, not preachers, not, not uh, people who sit and enjoy the presence of God and just listen to somebody fill us with all this hope and joy. It is so wonderful. And we sit in our living rooms and we watch this on TV and all this faith and joy. He's saying, no, no, no. Now the time and season, I'll, be, I'll speak it prophetically, but now is a time and season that we should be teachers. What does a teacher do? A teacher just doesn't implement knowledge. That's what we know in our school systems. <laughs> it used to, but in our school systems, is we, as teachers transfer knowledge. But the teacher in this sense, Jesus was a teacher. They called him Robona, master. Why? Because a teacher just didn't impart knowledge. He imparted methods and power. Amen. Mm. But to receive the power, we have to have be the students of strong meat. Not milk. Yes, sir. Amen. I used a more graphic example to my leadership in the war room this morning, but I can't do that on the camera. The somebody might be offended, but basically, uh, let's 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 get off uh, the nurse milk yes. Amen. and get into the strong meat. That's going to take a monumental change in our life because you might be able to hear it through one sermon but you're not going to be able to sustain it without the help of God. This is one of these things that we've got strong meat. This is going to be tough for us to gum. <laughs> you see, the, 
the, the, the little babies that take milk, they can go ahead and, and, and nurse off their mothers because they don't have teeth yet. Any mother that's nursed can tell you a baby, when it starts getting teeth, it's time to start weaning them <laughs> for your own safety. <laughs> But when strong meat, you got to have some teeth, boy. you got to put some teeth in this thing and, 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 and chew on it for a while and rip it down. But in that, God is going to bring a breakthrough for this season when we, became, when, when, we, when we get a hold of the strong meat. It's not just not knowing more. Well, strong meat must be those, those, those scriptures that we sidestep. It might be, but you can change that on your own. But when he talks about times and seasons and opportunity, God is going to rip ripped the heavens open one more time for us in a season of opportunity. We can't be sitting there nursing, still nursing on the milk. When that opportunity comes, we're going to have to step into the truth. What happened when Jesus was water baptized as soon as he went into the wilderness, fasted for 40 days, the devil showed up in person and tempted him with the very word that Jesus was. <laughs> How do you tempt him with the word? that He is the word. The word made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was, made, was the word that made flesh and dwells among us. But when he spoke, he said, the words I speak are spirit and they are life. Hmm. So the word that was spirit became flesh. And when it was spoken out again, it became spirit again. And accomplished that, what he, what he, what he said it to do. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Are we okay so far? Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Milk is that which comforts and soothes, but milk, meat is that which provokes change. Amen? We have in our life, I put this in my nose, I thought it was pretty good. So I, I, I thought back, I have some milk times and I've had some meat times. How many of us have some milk times and meat times? When I first started the church here in Key West 31 years ago, this was meat time, brother. <laughs> you had no idea. I, I, I left the cushy comfort of sitting under my pastor in, in his sanctuary and now pioneering a work that never existed here before uh, with a type of church that never really caught on here before and did it for the last 31 years. So get, that was meat time. But there was several times where God says, are you going to trust my breakthrough or are you just going to trust what you know? I said, well, I don't know a whole lot, so I'm going to trust your breakthrough. Amen. I put what I knew aside and be, begin to listen to the Lord. And the Lord began to change and transform that. And I see this happening again today. I mean, in this day, not just today, but in this day. I see God changing things again if he's doing that. I will start looking through the scriptures. Some of the prophets amaze me. I love, I love to listen. Isaiah is one of my favorites. I love the prophets and, and listen to what they said. Isaac, prophet Isaiah makes this statement in, in, in Isaiah 2.4. He said, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Does anybody know what that means? It's a, it's a biblical, poetic way of saying is we're taking the war time and we're bringing it now to plant in peacetime, turn into peacetime. Uh, he echoes the word again, echoes, the Lord, I should say, echoes the word again through Micah 4, 3. And he says, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Again, we're taking the implements of war and we're turning into implements of harvest, planting a season. Until That works good until you get to Joel. Joel chapter 3, verse 10 says, we are going to beat our plowshares into swords and our pruning hooks into, and pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, or the rest of that verse, let the weak say, I am strong. The word, I am strong, let the weak say, I'm a warrior. Here's the thing. All three of those scriptures I just read to you are dealing with the end times. Amen. Which one is true for here? <laughs> Which one's true? They're all true. And they all talk about Isaiah, Micah, and Joel all talk about the end times. And you can go ahead and split hairs while Joel was talking about how God's going to draw. The, you can do all that all you want, but the, take that phrase. He still made, this, made the word phrase. He still made that phrase. They shall beat their plowshares into swords and their pruning hooks into spears. There's a flip-flop in Joel. In other words, as they're talking about the last days, you hear a lot of people say, this is the last days, we're in the last days. Amen. If we are, the people are saying that better kick it in high gear then. Because basically, judgment, I read it a lot, judgment's going to begin in the house of the Lord with God's people. Yes, sir. Not with the world, with God's people. We've got a long ways to go. Yes, sir. 
Amen? I'm not saying it isn't. I said, do you believe we're in the last days? Yeah, I can see some things that, that would indicate that we're in the last days. No man's going to know the day or the hour of the turn of Christ, but we can know the season. Season again. The times. And God's saying you're living in a season where you're going to be beating your swords into plowshares and your plowshares back into swords again. There's going to be times where you're going to prepare for war, but then there's going to be times that we're planting. Amen. Both things are going to happen in the last days. Both things are going to happen in the ministry. Both things are going to happen in the church. At the same time, simultaneously, we are preparing for war. At the same time, simultaneously, we're preparing for a harvest. Amen. We're listening to the prophets, and this is what we're preparing for. We're planting the seeds. We're getting a heart for people. We're going out saving us up. But at the same time, we're coming back into the church. We're standing in warfare. We're standing against uh, the, the powers of darkness, and we're standing against from undoing what we just did. And both of those forces together are switching up and constantly switching up and changing, going back and forth in the time and season that we live in. That is going to be a monumental change upon the church and upon the average Christian. But it's going to be one that God is going to oversee and God is going to bring us through. Understand what Proverbs 18.9 says. He said, He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. He who is lazy and will not work is the same person that destroys the work that somebody else does. Amen. The same person who takes a complacent attitude to the church, complacent attitude towards God, a complacent attitude towards His Word, is the same as a person, if I can use that phrase, same phrase, is the same as the same person that opposes the work of God. Even though they won't raise one voice against Him, they still oppose the work of God. Because they will have no part in it. And by the, by the absence of not taking any part in it, they actually, according to Proverbs 18.9, uh, they're actually akin to the ones who, who stand his way. Jesus said it this way. He said, you're either for me or you're against me, one or the other. If you're not for me, you're not against me. There is no neutral ground. Amen. He drew a line in the sand for our spiritual life for us to come into. But on the right side of that, we go back to a lifestyle. I'm not looking at the next hard problem that comes up. I'm looking at the next breakthrough God's going to bring me through. Are you here? I addressed my leaders this morning in the war room. I said, here's what's happened in our church. We have more resources than we do people to carry out and help us build the thing with the resources that we have. The resources are actually taken over. So what do we do now? Let's start beating those plowshares because we have the resources from the, from the plowshares that have been beaten in the swords. Okay, or, or, or swords that have been beaten in plowshares. Now it's time to go back. Let's start warring for people. Set them free. Bring them into the church. Raise them up in the house of the Lord. Show what their purpose is. And put our hand to the plow without looking back at what you used to do yesterday and the day before. Nobody cares. Nobody cares what you used to do. You know, like the old southern guy said, well, I used to could. Give me a chance, I used to could again. <laughs> no, we're not used to could. It's right now. And this is what God has been telling me through this message. Which he, he's showing me. He says, no, no. He says, he says, listen, the time and season that you ought to be teachers. Now it's time to shift gears. And we should be demonstrating to the world what hope looks like. Listen, pandemics, government going nuts, whatever. We're going to show you what the house of the Lord Jesus Christ looks like. This is what hope looks like. Because we're not shrinking back. We're going forward. We're not shutting down. We're building back up again. And we will go around any obstacle that tries to in front of us and come be in front of us. And we'll make a way where there is no way. Because God will give us a breakthrough through the lines of the enemy like David had. And we'll take the strategies because there's times that we're going to do head-on attacks. And there's times that we're going to have to compass about. And only the Lord is going to be able to reveal those times to us. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Can I share something else with you? Yes, sir. I don't know if you've ever seen this. I remember Thomas. Amen. What do we call Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. But he doesn't doubt no more. How many, what was that guy who, who sat outside the walls of Jericho and Jesus walked by and says, Son of David, have mercy on me, Son of David. Who was that guy? Blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus. Didn't he get healed? Yeah. Why do we call him blind? He's not blind anymore. And the guy outside the temple that Peter come up, he says, silver and gold, I have none, but what I have to give you, rise and, 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 and walk. In the name of Jesus, what do we call him? Lame man. The lame man, but he's not lame anymore. Say, so what's your point, pastor? 
to the point. We have a tendency, a natural tendency, to focus on the old and not on the new. We have, we have a tendency to sit and stare at amazement at the miracle without moving on to the next thing God wants to do. That was nice, but that wasn't the only lame man that's been healed of the gospel. Are you here? And we're having them today. Praise the Lord. God brought that up. He said this way. Anyway, Thomas, doubting Thomas. He was doubting. He's not doubting anymore because Jesus fixed that for him. He'll fix that for you if you're doubting this morning. No way, Jesus will fix that. I just, I, I just thought it would be kind of comical, not comical really, it would be kind of entertaining to see Jesus do it the same way he did with Thomas to you. Anybody got any doubts here this morning they want rid of? Jesus has a way of doing that. If you read the story in John chapter 20, this isn't the first time Jesus saw his disciples when G Thomas was there. This was the second time. The first time was quite unique. They were so afraid that the Jews were going to kill them the way they killed Jesus, and clearly that they hid out. They were hiding in a room with the door shut. The Bible clearly says the door shut. And towards evening of that same day, the first day Jesus rose from the dead, uh, where he met Mary Magdalene and so on and so forth, he went and said it to the Father, he came back, and, and basically he walked around. And so they're in a room trying to shelter and trying to hide themselves because they thought that they're going to, each one of the members that followed Jesus, each one of the apostles was going to be crucified just like Jesus was, so they're afraid. Man, this is going to come down on us. This government is, is off, their, off their nut. I mean, they're absolutely nuts. They're going to come after us next. I hear this today. I hear this across the news today. Okay, but the fact is, is, is what Jesus, so what Jesus does, now they're in there, they're afraid. Can you see the picture? Yes. They're in fear. But they're sitting there, and you know, I don't know what to do. Uh, shut the door, don't let anybody see us. And I keep your voice down, don't let anybody hear us. But we'll hear and pray, we'll just go seek God, and we'll sit there. All of a sudden, Jesus walks through the wall and comes in. I don't know about you, but that doesn't do anything for my fear factor. He walks through the wall, walks through the door. Don't open the door. He just walks through, walks in the middle of it, and he puts out his hands and he shows them the hand, the whole prince, prince, his hand, he shows them his feet and he shows them his side. And then he said this. I'll take you to the first meeting. I'll get to the second one in the meeting. Is it okay? Yes. This is the first meeting. You know what he did? You know what he did? He, you know what he did? He said to them, he breathed on them. Did you ever have a dead person resurrected breathe on you? He breathed on them and he said this, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute, wait, back up the turnip truck. That happened on the day of Pentecost. That happened right here in the book of John. Amen. We have two outpourings of the Holy Spirit that people don't even realize. Amen. You know who wasn't there? The one that had a headache that day. Well, I don't know. You don't have to go to church every Sunday, do you? Thomas wasn't there. There's only 10 people there because Judas went out and hung himself. They only had the 11, counting Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. I think he's taking 10 people. We're breathed on by God, the Holy Spirit, and he says, go do what I say to do. Now, can I bring you to the second appearance? Here it comes up. This is really cool. They talk to Thomas. Finally, they get Thomas in there. Thomas is in there. Jesus does the same thing. He walks through the wall. Why can't he use the door like everybody else? You go up to him, you get your face in the ring, everybody can see who it is, fears that, you know, and you open the door, you see him on the iPhone, oh, I ask Jesus, let him in, let him in, let him in. No, 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 he's got to be a big shot. He's got to walk through the wall again. There's still, there's cut in, the door is shut. They're, they're met for the second time. They just know the Roman government's going to crucify them. And they're sitting there, and Jesus says, hi, how's everybody doing? It does not do a lot. And he's, this is what he says. He goes in there and he says, peace. Peace doesn't help, Jesus. Peace. That saying peace doesn't help. You're scared to live with bajikas out of you. Come to a wall. A physical man comes to a wall like a ghost, but he's there and he says, peace. It doesn't do a whole lot for our peace. <laughs> Thomas is there. And he goes up to Thomas. He says, then he said to Thomas, he says, reach your finger here and look at my hand, and reach your hand, and put your hand into my side. We're going to get real graphic with Mr. Doubtful that I said. Now here's the thing. 
course, Thomas did believe. He said, blessed are those that believe without seeing, yet believe. Amen? In other words, you're a higher class or higher up than those that have to see. But this is the thing. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. How many has ever seen? Well, seeing is believing. Oh, really? I can show you deceptions that the devil can show you something. And it isn't true at all. I, you, you can see something that is a total lie. Seeing is believing? No, not really. Not necessarily. Believe in God is seeing. We first believe him, then we see. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, you can sleep at this point if you want, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what happens. Amen. Amen. Thomas had no problem, not one problem did he have with the miracles when Jesus was walking with Jesus. He was part of the, the, the group. Did Jesus see that woman with the issue of blood get healed? Did he see Jairus' daughter raise up from the dead? Did he see that? Did he hear about it? He walked, he saw, did he believe that Jesus, who was he said he was? Jesus said, so that I'm the son of God. I am the son of God. Thomas was there. Did he believe that Jesus was the son of God? Yes or no? He believed that. He saw the miracles. He attended every church service and every revival service that Jesus conducted. He was there on the Sermon on the Mount listening to the longest preaching Jesus ever did beside the one that he, uh, he fed the 5,000. He saw him hand the bread, bless the bread and hand it. And he was part of the disciples that were breaking and caused the miracles by his hand. He was there. He saw that. Jesus said, he got all his disciples together. It is time. I'm going to go away. I'm, they're going to crucify me in Jerusalem. I'm going to die for the sins of the world. Peter said, not so, my Lord. This was the same guy who had the big revelation of who he was. So it wasn't just Thomas. Thomas, however, I'm not going to believe it. I don't believe Jesus raised from the dead. I do not believe that part of what he says. Is it possible as a Christian to believe in Christ, to be a churchgoer, to go to church, and go so far and say, no, I don't believe God's going to do that today. I don't believe God's going to do that today. And be totally, totally, are you ready for this? Wrong because Thomas was. If Thomas had only believed, he would have been there when Jesus breathed out the Holy Spirit upon him and filled them with the Holy Spirit before the day of Pentecost. Are you here? It is possible to recognize Jesus, to know him by name, listen to his teaching, memorize his book, and still, when it comes to the one thing, the one thing, resurrection, to change a person's life, here comes that strong meat again. Change that person's life that we blow it and walk totally away from it. Say, I will not believe unless I see. He saw all the things that Jesus did. What was so tough about this one? He had testimony that people actually saw Jesus walking around and he refused to believe. He took an act of his will and refused to believe what God was showing him. And God saw me, he says, that's part of the church today. Are you here this morning? Yes, amen. Amen. Good, good, Pastor, amen. What Thomas missed was the owning of the Holy Spirit, the breathing of the Holy Spirit. When Tom touched, can you imagine what it would have been like to have to slip, slip your hand in the slit in Jesus' side that was made with a spear? How many has ever heard somebody say, well, Jesus was a good man? Jesus was not a good man. Jesus was the Son of God. He was a perfect man. To believe that Jesus is anything less than he says he is, is to be in doubt and to call God a liar. Amen. Jesus is either who he says he is or he's a fake and a fraud. There is no in between. You must believe who Jesus is and what he's done for, and then take it personal and make him your personal savior. Yes, sir. Interesting, huh? Well, this message went a little bit different than what I thought. How do we release it? Let me get with the five minutes I got left. Let me give you how many want how to. How do I release this in my life? How many want that? Amen. Okay. I'm going to get back to the to to talk about confession. Amen. Proverbs 18:21 says, "Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Those that love it shall eat of its fruits." What does that mean? It means the words that come out of our mouth are important. Now I'm sorry that that some ministers and some big name ministers have used this power of confession just to get what they needed and wanted. I'm sorry that happened. 
But because they did doesn't excuse what Jesus said, it doesn't excuse what the scriptures tell us today. What we need to do, we need to go back and reread this stuff and understand the proper application to these things so we do it properly. Life and death are in the power of tongue, that's a matter of a fact. Uh, and those that love it shall eat of its fruits. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, you can put, write that down if you want to. In Acts chapter 4, they were under great persecution. This is after the ascension. The church was under great persecution. Everything that was going on, they were under great persecution. And this is what they said. Now, Lord, this was their prayer. Maybe we can learn something from this. Now, the Lord took onto their hearts and grant, to, Lord, look onto their hearts and grant unto your, no, I'm sorry. Let me start over again. Verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness that we may speak your word, stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through your holy name, servant Jesus. Amen. The church got together and said, Lord, they're threatening us. They're coming after us. They're, they they're want to kill us, crucify us, whatever. Lord, look at their threatenings, and please grant unto us the boldness to stand up against it Amen. and declare Lord. miracles. Yes. And by your hand, let us heal the ones that are sick. Yes. Yes. They were not, they were saying, by this prayer, let us boldly speak words. Yes. Let us boldly say the things you say now and heal in the mighty name of Jesus. Yes, amen. That's what he was saying. <clears throat> amen. Psalms 40 says this. David, I like this psalm. David, just, he just spells it right out for us. This is not just a New Testament, Old Testament. He says, I have proclaimed the good news. Proclaim, that means to speak. I proclaim the good, good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord. You yourself know I have not trodden your righteous within my, uh, I have not hidden my righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. This is what David is saying. He said, I have not concealed your loving kindness, your faith, truth from the great assembly. In other words, I stood up in a midst of a great number of people and I have proclaimed your heart. I have said what you are. I have stood by it. Amen, Lord, hear me now. I refuse to back down of what you showed me. I refuse to give up what you have given me. I refuse to deny now what you have shown me. And I stood up to it. And I declared it. Here's the key. See what God says in his word. Understand that the next problem is the next opportunity for breakthrough. And then there's a world watching to see how you handle it. And through that proclamation, when we begin to preach that word out and begin to declare that and breakthrough comes, God again will rip open the heavens, yes, amen. pour out his amen. word. Hallelujah. One more last question. Let me ask you this. What is more powerful to speak the word out of your mouth or to speak the word out of or the word spoken out of Jesus's mouth? Which is more powerful? The word spoken out of Jesus' mouth or the word spoken out of your mouth, which is more powerful? I'll give you another minute to think about it. <laughs> they are the same. Because Jesus did spoke the words that his father said. And the father gives us his word now and we speak the same word. The thing that's different is the amount in, in, in the methods that we do and when we speak in the, in, in the application, but the word is still going forth powerful. I don't know why sometimes uh, this works and sometimes that doesn't work as we see things work. <clears throat> All I know is the shortcoming is always on our end, never on God's end. <clears throat> I can't explain every shortcoming because <clears throat> we, we can't read everybody's heart like yeah, and we don't know what the faith is, different things like that. I mean, that would be that. Maybe the season, maybe the time, maybe the things. I've heard people say, well, I, don't, I can't seem to hear God anymore. Have you done the last thing he said? <clears throat> I don't seem to hear God anymore. Have you done the last thing that he said? Hallelujah. Amen? I know this message has been a little bit challenging this morning, but these are what I'm beginning in the in, in, in Lord. But I know this. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says this. He says, we have his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. <clears throat> Anything that falls outside the line of good works 
falls outside of our realm of purpose. Hmm. He said that the rest of that good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Anything outside of that. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony <clears throat> overcame the powers of darkness. By the, word of the, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Word. That's again the word spoken out. Amen. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, the word spoken out. The word testimony doesn't mean I stand up here and say, You see what happened to me this week? And I just this and this, and God just came down, and that's my testimony. That's not what testimony means. In the biblical part, testimony, that's good. I mean, we, we revive on it. It's your witness. But the fact is, the testimony is what it means in the, in, in the, in the b- biblical vernacular. What it means is, I want to do it again. Amen. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of testimony, in other words, God's saying, testimony, I want to do it again. When we say, this is our testimony of the church, God says, I want to do it again. I want to do it again. I get a wonderful testimony. I was healed. God is saying, because you're giving a testimony, I want to be healed. I want to do it again. I want to heal other people. I want to do it again. Because I did it for you, now I want to do it again. And that has a connotation that God wants to do it again. Get anything out of the word this morning. I got more, but I got to stop. uh, I didn't run out of steam. I just ran out of time. Praise the Lord. How many got something out of the word this morning? I realize this is a little bit different word than I've been preaching. It's a little more challenging. But this is a prophetic word. God, ushers, you can go ahead and prepare for the, for the baptism. Go ahead. And uh, our baptism candidate. Uh, we have, oh, by the way, we're having a water baptism too. So you can still take, stay tuned uh, um, for our water baptism. Music team, you can go ahead and do what you're doing. I'm just going to say my final words and we're closing out. And we're going we're gonna to switch gears and go into baptism mode. Praise the Lord. How, how many say amen? amen. Uh, so we're going to switch gears and go into baptism mode. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Josiah came up to me last night, and he says, um, he says uh, Pastor, I need to be water baptized. He says, I said, can you water baptize me? I says, yeah. I says, uh, before we left the church last night from prayer, I says, fill the tank. We do this in-house, by the way, so you'll have seen it. There they, it takes strong men to open it up and to um, ba- water baptism. Praise the Lord. So, uh, and, but Josiah has been water baptized before, probably by me, was it? Yeah. A water baptized but what happens is, well, why do you need to be water baptized again? What do you need? What do you care? Uh, what happens is sometimes people don't, changes in their life, changes in, in whatever they do, they want to get, they need to reboot. How many have a computer that they've ever needed rebooted? <laughs> I'm not saying it's a computer, but the thing is, is that a lot of times we allow that to reconnect again with God. Last time you were how old? Ten or something. How old are you now? 18. Listen, when the teenagers want to get water baptized, get connected with God, I say, Amen. Hallelujah. Let's take the coat off, roll up our sleeves, and let's get her done. Hallelujah. Because basically, this is the generation that's going to march before us in water baptism. The word that I preached this morning, this is the thing. What are we doing right now? We're switching from swords to plowshares. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, we're going to live this word, I'm telling you. This is going to be it. So, what happened? We're, we're, we're now. Because of we, how many how many have been praying that we um, that people are impacted? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Da da. Amen. How many are praying that God does miraculous healings? Yes. Amen. Da 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 da. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? We pray this and then we're surprised. <laughs> wow. It really happened. It's like Peter when he was let out of prison. He comes up to the door and Rhoda says, he's at the door. Oh, no, he's in prison. They've, what have they been praying for? Praying for? See, <laughs> praise the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> don't pray for, you know, pray for revival. Don't uh, have a revival. But praise the Lord. Revival. The fact is, is we, 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 are, we are seeing these changes. I'm, I'm examining those three prophets again. Okay, we're getting to our swords and beat them into plowshares. Take them same plowshares, beat them back into swords again. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Because basically, this, God is calling us to do double duty yes, in his last days, and we're, we're grateful for it. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. If you have to leave, you can leave. If not, we just uh, we ask you, invite you to stay in witness of water baptism. If you've never seen how we do water baptism here, it's quite, it's quite a process. And, and, and uh, I've seen people come up out of the water. Years ago, I baptized a guy. He was a Baptist. 
you think a Baptist would be baptized. Well, he has several times. He said, no. He said, you've done a teaching on water baptism. He said, I want to baptize again. We dunked him in the water. He came speaking in tongues. Then he asked us, what is that? <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit, brother. <laughs> we had to school him and tell him what it was. He said, this is wonderful. I said, how do you feel? He said, I feel great. He said, I feel like a new person. He said, you are. Amen. The waters of baptism is where we, where we identify identification. You need to change your identification, or we all need to change our identification from what the world sees in us to what God has called us to be. Amen. Water baptism, we do it by immersion. Okay, basically what happens is a circumcision of heart, as Paul says in, in the book of Colossians, but in Romans 6 it says, it says that we are an identification to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's what it's about. What it does for the individual is up to them. I give them a mic if they want to share. If they don't want to share, that's fine with them. But the fact is, I want to get anybody in the tank that we can. Amen. Yes, sir. I want to see yes. water tracks all over this that's carpet right. that's yes. been... Flooded by Santa Irma and all the other ones that have been flooded, and Wilma, and all the ones. This carpet's been seen more floods. So a little bit of walk, baptism. I, I get excited when baptism water goes right on, walk, walk it right on down the carpet here. We don't care, amen. Because what happens is a change. It's talking about a change of person's life. Are we ready this morning? Yes. Let me go ahead and bless those in, in this this part of the service and come into the water baptism. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your word going forth. Let us have ears to hear and a heart to receive this morning the things that you are talking to your church. Yes. Father, we come from all different backgrounds, all different levels of faith, all different things going here this morning. But Lord, I think we've preached a message that can minister to all. Please let everyone hear the heart of this pastor and bring in the message. There is no condemnation whatsoever in, the, in, in Christ Jesus at all. Nothing said this morning was met in any way, shape, or form as condemnation. But I can say this, it may be a wake-up call for the church now to shift gears because the time is right. Are we here? Yes, sir. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you. Your blessings upon us, and we give you the praise and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. So how many want to see a water baptism uh, in this church in Key West? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, matter of fact, I can do this right here. Uh, this water, this baptism is of my design, custom made. It's for a reason. I believe water baptism should not be put off. I believe an inclination. We're not going to have a baptism yeah. month, a baptism Sunday, or a baptism week, or a baptism day. We're going to have a baptism event. Anybody who wants to water baptize, I'll be glad to baptize anybody that wants to change in their life and wants to get connected with Christ. I will do it. Praise the Lord. I will do it in the name of Jesus, and I will do it in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when I get done, they will raise up a new person. Yes. This is the idea of water baptism. This is what we want to pray across. It's an identification. The identity that we go in is going to be changed when we come out. Because now there's a new revelation. Now why I will do it again and again, and some churches they only do it once, is because people have a, an encounter with God that kind of demands this again. Whatever reason, I'm not sitting there to sort out the reasons, but we'll do it. Because every time I've done it, I have seen a change in a person's life. I've, did, I've literally baptized hundreds of people. And every time, I'm always amazed at how God does something different and changes their life. Jesus meets them in that water, under the water. When we go under the water, it says in Romans 6, we identify with the burial. When we come up, we identify with the resurrection. Death of the old man burial in the tomb, raised up with Jesus, yes. and now we have, our, we have our mind, our soul, and our being ascending to heaven along with him, sitting at the right hand of the Father with him. Someday it will be for real. I mean, not for, uh, it's always real, but it, someday it will be in the physical. Now it's just in the spiritual. But we have now are connected to a spiritual realm that sits on his side. Yes, sir. So why do you do it in both the na name of this? I get asked this question a lot. Okay, why do you do it in the name of Jesus and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Because it, that, that issue has become a dividing point in many camps. And I see both scriptural. So I put the both camps together and do it scriptural so nobody has a problem with it. Amen. However, they may anyway. <laughs> but I believe it's... Well. Now, here's, what the, here's a revelation of that. In the name of Jesus, change and transformation begins as identification. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, our name in the three parts that we're made up with, now the Holy Spirit sits on the right hand of the Father. Amen. And it opens us up to the receiving of the Holy Spirit. 
Da -da. Yes, Amen. Probably the reason why he put both of them in the scriptures. Yeah. Are you ready? Yes. Amen. Uh, go ahead and, and sing as we're preparing here. Praise the Lord. I think we're almost ready anyway. Praise the Lord. Yep. You know the, you know the process. One more step down. There you go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. Let's stand up. Let's give them praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Besides, you want to share anything before? No, nope, he wants to share nothing. He just wants to get dunked. He, he wants Jesus right now, right? Okay, let, 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 me, let me put the mic down. I'll go pray for him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Father, we just thank you for Josiah right now. We baptize him. And Lord, let me this be a second time for his baptism. But Father God, we know that you're regenerating something in his heart. And Lord, only you can bring a person to this place. It isn't religion that we do this. It's not a religious act. Uh, Father God, it is a connection with the Holy Spirit in which, you, which you're putting upon his heart. It's a connection with your word, and it is our identification of death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And we thank you, Father God. We baptize Josiah in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, goes down in the waters of baptism, signifying the death of Christ, to rise up, to rise up anew, the Bible says, anew, a new life in Jesus' name. New life, brand new. In the name of Jesus, right now, hallelujah. Praise, you, Father. hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Now, doesn't that just make you want to get back in the waters again? 
<laughs> I love it. When God showed me Revelation and Acts, where Paul and Silas were in the prison, in the middle of the night, they didn't wait for a ceremony. They didn't wait to get to the door. They went to the man's house and baptized him right there. It was that important. Something that is that urgent and that important. We have this right now. This is a custom-made baptistry that we can fill in 42 minutes. Holds over six, 800 gallons. I forget what it was. But it, we can fill it in 42 minutes. I want to be the type of pastor that we can shift gears and move. Amen. When he's a, This was last night after prayer. Josiah came up. He said, I really want to be baptized again. I says, okay, Elder Skip talked with him, and he says, yes, you want to be baptized again? He says, is, 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 can I do it tomorrow? Says, yeah, tomorrow's a good day. Let's get it done. I want to do any day. Any day can be a water baptism day. It is that important. Because if we don't have the connection with Jesus Christ, when the Lord says move, we need to move, we, and the church needs to be ready to move. Amen. So they all, the deacons stayed around. We filled up the baptism. We get, sometimes we've got to clean it first and fill it all up. And get, they did all the work. So I thank you for the ministry of helps that have done this. Yes. Faithful leaders in the house of the Lord. God bless you for the work and for the time that you put in. Many of my leaders drive up the keys. And they got a, you know, they got a, a whole long, I don't know why they went up there. I, I live in Key West. I, I thought Key West was, was, was the Mecca. So I don't know, or paradise, you know, whatever you want to call it. But, uh, it, but uh, some live up the Keys. But, um, so they put the time in. So I want to thank all my leaders and thank all our, our ministry of helps for getting it together. Josiah, it's a brand new day. Amen. Now you're moving from a little kid uh, I baptized as 10 years old to now he's 18. Okay. Uh, new, new place. We need God in our walk wherever we go. Father, we thank you for this time. We bless Josiah again in the name of Jesus. Bless him, Father God. In Jesus' mighty name, let him continue to lead and guide him. And we thank you for in the name of Jesus. Amen.